Hey everybody, Mean Joe with Balsa USA. So here we are, episode four of the Shop Time Live Newport 17 one six scale build along. Welcome, guys. I got Chuck and I got Ronnie in studio. Uh, how we doing? We're doing good. How you doing tonight, Joe? Very good. Excellent. All right. So I want to make a quick reminder. Let me get my right screens going here. Don't forget to swing over by BalsaUSA.com if you want to build along with us and input coupon code N17 build, all caps, no spaces, and you will be able to pick up a Balsa USA 1 6 scale Newport 17. Uh, so you can follow along. This is not a requirement. You can watch these videos and enjoy them without actually building the airplane if that's what you want to do, but it is available for you. All right. So last week we got to step five, I believe. Uh, yes. step, was it step five or step seven? Step five, I think, is where we stopped. We stopped. Okay. Oh, step seven. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yep. We got okay. to step seven. So this week we're going to be covering getting the fuselage, or I'm getting the uh, firewall installed. Uh, we're going to talk about how to get that all on there. Uh, we're going to talk about getting the forward landing gear block in, and we might get to, if time permits, we might get to the cabane strut mounting in the upper deck this evening as well. Um, I do want to cover a couple of things. So we had a gentleman that got on here. I believe his name was Gary, and he was asking a couple of questions about the motor. I believe he said he had a 64 stroke, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, I want to make right. sure that he understands that that would be an okay motor for this airplane. It is going to be a little bit large for this airplane, but it's also going to be uh, uh, because the four stroke runs a little slower and it's going to be a little bit heavier. You're going to get the nose weight that you need. And it actually should fly it pretty good. The only caution that we want to make sure you understand is, is that it is going to be a little bit much motor for that. So you want to make right. sure you use throttle control and you want to be aware of the P factor. So just to explain what the P factor is, the P factor is the tendency for the plane to yaw due to the spin of the prop. So basically what happens is, is if you get too much prop and too much motor, when your airplane lifts off the ground, it's going to want to yaw. OK, that's basically the exclamation explanation of it. Uh, just to simplify it, that's pretty much what it does. You just have to be aware that you might need a little bit of rudder input when you take off. Possibly. Absolutely. It depends. And I would fly it like that and see how you like it and adjust from there. And I'd start playing with props as well. And, you know, the, like you said, Joe, you really nailed it. On advantage of that little bit larger motor, which is definitely on the upper side of what's recommended for the aircraft. It's going to need a nose weight, which is always good, and it's a four-stroke, so it tends to run in lower RPM ranges. But with that bigger engine and swing a, a theoretically a bigger prop, you'll get that P factor. So the airplane's going to want to torque to the left as you start to roll out. However, if he plays a little bit with the with the props a little bit, which is mean reducing that pitch, which that pitch will actually reduce that P factor somewhat and be gentle on the throttle, it should be a successful airplane or, um, aircraft and uh, shouldn't have really for any, any any problems. But like I said, I, I totally agree with you, Joe. Um, it is definitely on the upper end, maybe even pushing that upper end a little bit, but uh, it could fit and uh, fly well. Yeah, it should fit in. I did some measuring. It should fit in everything okay. You just got to be aware of a couple of little nuances that you're going to get out of it. One of the things that people make a mistake on with uh, our airplanes, particularly if they're not used to flying these World War One airplanes, is they get on the stick and they want to mash the throttle to take off. You, you want to bleed that throttle in nice and easy. You want to get the wheels up. You get that tail wheel, that tail skid up off the ground, and then pull the power up so you get off nice and smooth. Then she'll just fly off the ground. She'll just come off the ground. You just got to be aware. And what that's going to yeah. do is if you increase that throttle too quickly, it's actually going to increase the P factor while you're on the ground. And then it turns from a P factor into a pucker factor because you don't want a knife edge <laughs> a Newport 17 inches from the ground. It doesn't usually work out too good. Yeah, so absolutely. just be aware of that. Um, okay, I got a couple questions real quick, and then we'll get started. I got David. Let's do uh, it's it. actually right there, buddy. He says, speaking of motors, uh, the setup I was looking at consists of an E-Flight Power 46.8, I'm assuming you mean 80-amp ESC, and a 4S5000. 
The 4S5000 is going to be quite a bit of battery. That's going to be pretty heavy. And I can tell you right. what I'm running on. I've got two versions of this setup. The one that I'm going to run on this setup, I believe, is going to be, well, what I'm, I'll am i tell you what I've got on, because I've got one built right there that I just converted. And it's actually got a power or a Rimfire 32 with a Castle 75 amp ESC. And I'm going to run that on two uh, 3S 5200s, one at a time. Um, the 3S is probably going to fit a little bit better for you, but I, what I would do is I would do some measurement of the pack you're going to use and see how it does. The reason I'm going to use the two 3S's is for the nose weight. Um, and I will right. say that that airplane with the Rimfire 32 is going to be a little bit more scale uh, than the other ones. The other ones I have, I have them set up on big setups. So one set up on a high max uh, 5130, 80 amp ESC, and the other one is set up on a Power 52 80 amp ESC and runs on a 4S. And it's the triplane, and it will literally torque roll. So uh, <laughs> just so I you know. I got a little bit of input on it, David. Yeah, um, go ahead. I did a Southwick Pup, the six-scale Southwick Pup, uh, about a year or two ago. Ronnie and I did a Hangar 331, and um, we actually had that set up in an E-Flight e 25 with a 3S uh, 2500 pack. And the performance on it was typical scale. It, the aircraft would do all the uh, maneuvers that the original one would do. Um, this one, I think Ryan and I have been talking about it. I might bump it up to the, to the uh, E-Flight 32. I looked at the 46, uh, but be honest with you, um, battery size performance, um, length of flight, uh, battery packs. I think we're going to end up doing the 32 uh, E-Flight 32 with a uh, uh, 70 amp, 75 amp speed controller and, and a 3S packs uh, somewhere in that 5,000, 4,800 to 5,000 range. So that's preliminary what we're what we're looking at at the moment, but uh, stay tuned. And uh, for me, it's about the prop I can spin, the pitch I want to, the size of the prop, the, um, uh, the pitch of the prop. That's kind of where I'm looking at on how I want to fly and where I want to fly this thing. Plus the duration of the flight as well. I want to be able to fly this thing and cruise the friendly skies, you know, an easy eight to 12 minute kind of thing. So that, that's what I'm looking at. Yep. And I got that same setup. So I've got a few of the six scales done already. I've got the, uh, the Newport, I've got the, uh, D eight, I've got the DR one, I've got the, uh, what's the other one, the pup and they're the all pup, yeah. everything, but the Newport is really, to be honest with you, overpowered because I'm running those on a six S setup. So they are, they are hot, They're but spiding. they fly, they fly forever. Yeah, <laughs> I can yeah. fly that pup on that setup. It's a, it's let's see, that one's a, uh, E-Flight 52 with an 80 amp ESC and I'm running it on six yeah. S that thing will fly for like 20 minutes because you're oh, only using like quarter throttle. Yeah. Right. So, yep. you know, it's just, it's, a, it's a matter of what you want to use. And also, the pup is a little bit bigger of an airframe. When you look at the size of the airframe compared to a new, the Newport 17 and even the little Newport 11s, they're a, definitely a smaller um, aircraft. Even though it's a one six scale, like the like the pup is, overall the full scales are a little bit smaller. So when you get in those bigger ones, like with the well with the pup, they got a little bit more room. So you have a little bit more flexibility to run some uh, some bigger power packs to, to increase your flight times and your performance. Yep, and David, last thing on that is, is if you if you watch, if you stay tuned, I'm going to be doing setups and all of that stuff on all these six scale airplanes and getting the recommended setups all set up and tested. The only one so far that I haven't tested is the Rimfire 32 on the other Newport that I have sent here. Yeah, the rest of them I've flown. That triplane has got hundreds of flights, and the the pups probably get thousands on those setups, and I like both setups really, really well. So, Fantastic. All right, so okay. let's get going. Gary says thanks. That answered his question, obviously, so we should good. be good to go. <laughs> Keep asking away, Gary. Okay, so we left off at step seven. So uh, what there was, our airframe was pinned down to the board. We had all the um, F2, three, and four in place. The aft laundrons in place, tail taped together or glued together. So now at this point, we have a straight airframe. Okay. And also, we tack glued in that firewall up front. And why they say tack glued, we'll get to that in a little minute in a minute. That's just to square up, tighten up that front end a little bit, um, uh, do, a little, and, uh, do a little bit of preliminary sanding, double check, make sure everything's nice and square. So uh, my airframe is already off the board. Um, everything is, is straight and true. 
remember guys, this is balsa wood. If you're off off a sixteenth of an inch here or or whatever, don't sweat it. It's not that big a deal. Um, but just even your eyeballs are good enough. And that's where coming back to putting all the center lines in, as you see down here. Okay. And if you I don't know if you can see back in the bulkhead, I'll shoot an angle like there where all my center lines are in here as well. That's just a nice reference. So when I do sight down these, that your eye tends to follow those and everything's looking pretty good. No twists. Everything's pretty true and square. I went through it and I lightly sanded, block sanded everything down. Users trusty block, block everything nice and crisp. And all we're doing at that point is taking off all the little picky bumps, Mickey bumps, or everything that where the glue dribbles out and things like that. And everything is nice and crisp and clean. The firewall, she's tack glued in. I got a nice flush face there. Okay, so once that in and you're happy and go, and I do it just this point to go back in and hit all your little cross members with your thin CA. Just add a little bit of uh, uh, reinforcement in there, get it nice and nice and tight. And now you've got a nice airframe. And that's exciting. We're off the board, guys. This is a big step in the process of building. Um, you start here with a nice straight here and everything else will follow being true and square as well. So, so I want to add a couple of things. Two things you should make sure you do for sure. Make sure you go. This is I can't say this enough. It happens all the time. Make sure you go through and glue everything solid at this step. <laughs> once you know your airframe is square and once you know you're good to go, hit every single piece that you put in and make sure it's glued in good. The other thing that I wanted to touch base on that we didn't really talk about last week that I wanted to touch base on is before you glue the actual firewall in, now is the perfect time to get your center line. So if you if you do a 45, I'll cross both corners and then do bisecting angles parallel in both directions, the center where all the lines meet is going to be the center of your firewall. It's really simple to do it while it's flat on the table. It's a lot easier to do. You don't have to measure anything. You just 45, 45 and parallels bisecting in the center and you will have the center of your firewall. Good point, Joe. Very good point. And that's why, and what he's talking about guys is that is when you start mounting whatever, if, a, if it's an E flight or a rim fire or a combustion engine, there's your thrust line. That's your center line. Everything's right there. It makes it easy to just drop it in, mark it, drill it, and you're ready. And you're ready to go. Yeah, it's so, a lot easier to do it flat on the table than it is once you get it on the airframe. <laughs> oh man, you're trying to handle it and cradle it. And everything. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're all we're all thumbs here. So, um, okay. So looking into uh, step eight, where we removed the, moved the aircraft or the fuselage from the table. We sanded. We reinforced the glue. We did all that. We're all happy. In the step nine, um, we're going to take our three three eighths inch uh, angle or uh, uh, tri stock, and what we're going to do now is we're going to reinforce in that bulkhead, that firewall. Okay, and what this is doing, this is just adding basically it's more gluing surface for you. And what I did, remember when I said I tack glued that in, and that's it. And the only reason I tack glued it in was so that when I do put in the triangle stock that it's nice and square and tight in there. So there's no extra glue globs or anything like that hanging around. So it doesn't, so uh, so you don't have an interference with the triangle stock. Now, say for example, there is some glue that's laying around and you can't get in there and pick it out. Something that I do, and it's just more of a uh, a habit at this point, I'll actually take my tri-stock and at the, at the point end, the bottom of the triangle, I'll actually just sand that slightly around, just put a little bit of radius on it. And what that does is it tends to make it just snug up and fit in there. It's a little bit tighter because if that firewall is not a perfect 90 and the triangle is, then you're going to have gaps on the side. So just a little builder's note there. Plus, it also allows a little bit some of the epoxy to flow in there um, and squish out a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and pre-sand those little corners off. Just and I'm, Guys, I'm not taking much. I, as you see, I'm just taking a couple of swipes off. I'm just taking the point off. That's, that's all I'm doing. And what I'm going to do is... I'm going to mix up some epoxy. I'm going to I'm going to epoxy these in. I've also dry fitted my landing gear, my front landing gear rail. And I know this is jumping ahead a little bit because I'm going to use the same epoxy to put in that landing gear rail. OK, so I've got that landing gear rail pre-fitted in there. That looks good. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix up enough epoxy to do my triangle stock and my landing my landing gear rail. 
And that'll, like I said, it's five minutes. This will go pretty quick. Um, I'll get that in there, and then we can move on to the next step. So I'm going to do that. Ronnie, what you got going on there, friend? I'm actually doing the same exact thing that you're doing. Got my firewall already tacked in. I'm getting ready to mix up some epoxy. Fantastic. And and I don't know if you guys can see this, but I'm, this is just, I use these little little cups. I get them online. They have little measurements on there. They're in grams on one side um, and else is on the other. Um, my buddy, Pete Goldsmith, he puts his uh, epoxy on a scale and he pours into what are four grams, six grams, whatever, then puts the part two in on whatever that gram is and, and, and matches that. Um, with these particular little cups and plus specifically the volume I'm using on these, there's enough little hash lines that I can see and how I'll let it settle. For you guys, and we talked about that in our our first episode, if you tend to work in a little bit co a cooler basement um, where your epoxy tends to not flow, you can do a couple of things. Joe talked about um, putting them in the microwave for like three seconds. Um, I, in the past, I did a little bucket, like an old uh, Tupperware bowl, put hot water in there, and I'd set my bottles in there. And that residual heat out of the water would just soften the epoxy enough just to make it... Uh, pliable enough for me but i'm looking i need actually need to add a little bit more there because we're going to do that landing gear rail so a couple of things on the in. epoxy while they're getting mixed up here is first off on this gear block here that you can see that is a good place to see how close you are on your build that if you did everything right and your sides are in the right spot that landing gear that forward landing gear block should slide right in there perfectly so with this one here there's no sanding there's no uh i didn't adjust any parts or anything it was right on there so that's a good point there and then the other that's thing a real is good indicator yep yep if it's right then you know you did everything right the other thing that I will share is also uh, medicine cups. So if you don't want to order those oh, cups, you if you save the medicine cups that the kids get for all of their different, you know, the nighttime stuff or whatever, we'll save all that stuff. Uh, over the years, you collect quite a few. So I've got a big stack of medicine cups. It's basically the same thing Chuck has, but we've already got that stuff, just stuff you've already got on hand. Yeah, this is just one of those things that I always – um, pick up when I see it. Sometimes oh, I, yeah. I see it at Myers or whatever. Just my wife hates it when I go shopping with her because I'm off doing the weird stuff and <laughs> into the weird aisles, looking at all the kids' stuff and the party favors because I'm looking at mixing sticks and everything like that. So, yep, all right. absolutely. So the, the top rail mount. That's a nice fit. And guys, I don't know if you can see here. I'm gonna just show you. I'm just poking my exacto knife into one end. And I'm using that as my holder. Also, that's what I'm going to use to slide in the, the tri-stock. Not using a lot, just enough to get the job done because everything is weight. doesn't matter if it's a little airplane or a big airplane. Too much glue can be just as detrimental. So I'm going to do that in place. Looking good. And one more piece. And as Guys, you can I tell, I already so, had my stuff oh, done. Yeah. And that, that helps during the build process. So Joe can show you exactly what we're doing and talking about. And what's so nice, too, is how just this kit really just goes together so nicely. And that one's in. All right. And then let's do landing gear rail. And I'm good. And on this landing, this forward landing gear rail, it, something. the only thing you really have to pay attention to is that it does sit a little, let me see what side here, a little pronounced off the, off the wood here. And uh, the reason why is that we're going to sheet. And like Joe's showing right there, we're going to um, take our bottom sheeting, is going to bump against it forward and rearward. And then when we'll do our final sanding, it'll kind of blend it in. But what that does is it kind of keys everything in and locks everything in. So you don't have soft balsa. Now you're trying to put landing gear straps on top of. You just literally, literally have a hard point uh, all around. I'm going to put the epoxy off to the side. And I got a little bit on my hand, so I'm going to find a real quick rag. 
How we doing, Sal? Good to see you, buddy. Uh, Bo, uh, Sato 40 is going to be about perfect. That's right in the wheelhouse of what we recommend for this airframe. And remember, guys, typically in World War One subjects, you, you'll do a little bit less pitch. All right. And you can actually go to a little bit more fatter scale type of prop. Um, back in the days, I used to love tornado props or in Grish props, I believe, because they're a little bit fatter. Um, but also less pitch under World War One. You don't need that maximum airspeed, but you also um, want a little bit bigger diameter for a little bit more bite into the air. So, uh, all right. Well, we're probably pretty close to being set up here. It's been about five minutes. And that's all I use. That's all I need. That's a perfect enough strength. Just one last double check in here. Everything's looking good, square and tight. Gary, you awesome. could use uh, slow or thick CA for this step if that's what you choose. It would be absolutely. Just fine. And I'll be honest with you, that's what I used. I used thick CA. Uh, like we talked about the only the other day, the only time I really ever use epoxy in my builds is for uh, firewall mounts and for hinging. So that would be a good take. I don't, I'll tell you what I do and I don't have a lot of issues with this, but I don't often e epoxy in the gear block. I use uh, thick CA because my thinking behind that is, is if I do have a hard landing, uh, it's not going to tear the sides out of the airplane as badly. So at least that's my opinion. Okay. Moving forward on, not the landing gear rails in. So we're like looking at full 16 in the manual which is actually step 11. Remember guys, when I said all the punch outs and the knockouts to save all those, put them in a scrap box, you know, that I got here, all the, all the scrap pieces. This is where this stuff comes in handy at. So I need a scrap piece of balsa. So I'm gonna grab, I'm gonna grab something out of here. Yeah, that'll work. And what I need to do, is I need to fill this gap in right here between the landing gear rail and just this bulkhead. And what that's gonna do is just, going to strengthen it up a little bit and joe's going to talk a little bit further later on about that box area for for electric conversion so now let's take my scrap piece and i'm going to rough in a piece put a couple of tick marks here and what i'm going to do about like that i can use a straight edge use my standing block sometimes as a straight edge it's just handy but uh it's on its own, so here you can see that yeah he's talking positive. about right here this is yeah. the gap he's working on right here. See the other piece back in the old scrap box is I'm sure I'll need something a little bit later, but I'm just right now at this point, this is just trial and error, part and fit, that kind of thing. So I'll mark it there. I'm just using the reference points on the bulkhead. That looks good there. Let's see how our first cut's going to go. This usually tells the story if I, I'm doing something right or I'm doing something wrong here. That looks good there. Oh, that looks real good there. Just need to trim off this edge a little bit because I did leave it just a little bit long. Yeah, we do there, we do there. Bingo, all right, I like that. I'm gonna put a little bit of a bevel on it just so it slides in there nice and uh, nice and neat. Get my handy dandy Balsa USA gold thick and glue it in place. Guys, at this point, the build is actually gonna start picking up pace. Um, once the critical structure of getting a few sides together, nice and square, tight, that kind of thing. Um, that's always important. And obviously that's always time consuming. So uh, that's why I was a little bit slower going. But at this point, we're gonna pick up the pace here a little bit and things start to start to make progress. So, all right, that's perfect. That looks good. Nice tight finish. Once that CA dries, I'll take a couple of swipes of the sandpaper. I left it a little bit proud so that I can always sand down to it and keep it a little bit um, 
make a nice make a nice finish so anytime i do even on for doing in cheating or anything like that say i knock a hole and i put my thumb through it or something i'll the way i'll fix that is I'll actually cut a square out if there's a hole like a round hole i'll never match that round hole all right so but i'll cut a square out of where that hole was at put another piece of balsa in there probably a size bigger say for example if it's uh a 16th inch sheeting um i'll bump it up to an eighth inch all right and i'll i'll thin it in there and i'll leave it a little bit proud of the surface so then i can sand contour back down to it and it'll blend in like you never like you never broke anything so i'm gonna let that dry let that set up a little bit and i'll plane down plane down to it okay so jumping ahead looks like uh we got our triangle stock uh um for the firewall triangle stock for the uh where we got a landing gear rail doubler in and one thing i should have mentioned and i could have done but i didn't because i wasn't going that far ahead was there's some scrap triangle stock that we'll be using and we actually will put that in on the landing gear rail you can really see in there it actually fits right underneath the rail and we'll use some scrap um tri stock to do that and that's that that i'm gonna just ca in all right and that's just like i said it's just more surface area <coughs> excuse me so i'm gonna go ahead and cut where's my handy dandy razor saw i'm gonna cut about two oh three quarter inch triangle stock from my scrap piece here because it's really hard to see i'm gonna show you here on the screen up under here there you go right in there in that corner see if i can do this right there is where he's building the triangle stock in it's just to reinforce the gear block on both sides now if i was really excited I would have actually ended up uh, did that triangle stock in before I glued in the the mount the landing gear mount, but that would take a little bit more finessing. And I, I did want to follow along with the manual, so let's go ahead and I'm going to use my thick CA right here, and I'm going to, I am going to put it in on my handy dandy knife. I'm using that so I don't glue it to my fingers. But you have done many a times before, so all righty there. So why he's gluing in that spot, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you real quick what I did a little different. So for me, I know the setup that I'm going to be using is going to be electric, okay? So what I did is inside here, I went ahead and boxed this area out inside the fuse crutch, Okay. The reason I did that is because that gives me something to Velcro my battery packs to. And I'm going to show you a picture here. That's the setup I'm going to wind up using right there. So that's the bottom side of the other Newport 17 that I have here. And I've already cut a spot out. No, so what I'm going to do differently on mine is, is I'm actually going to make a hatch. So I did mine a little bit different here. So this piece right here, there's going to be a hatch here. There's going to be a little magnetic hatch that pops on here. I can cover it when I cover the airplane. I'll put a little handle on it so you can grab it and open it. And it'll just be a little magnetic hatch right there. That's why I did my front end a little different. Instead of sheeting, I made this so I can put in a hinge. So I can put a couple of hinges in here and then open my hatch. This end will have the, the um, magnets on it, and when I shut it, you won't even be able to see that it's under there. So that was a little different. All right. Ronnie, I've got my lower uh, triangle stock in on the landing gear rail. How you doing? I got the same done. Okay. So at that point, and I think, and that, that Joe, you had a very good point on the battery box. Um, on that in the bottom, and that's Probably uh, that's a very good way of, of doing that, and it allows you a good surface to mount your batteries. I'm an adventurous type. I'm one of those guys, uh, always what if. And I think what I'm going to do, and I'll have to try it out first, is I'm going to make my top half of my cowl on the front removable. All right? So I'll be able to service everything through the front of the cowl. The plus side is, obviously, I don't have to flip the airplane upside down on its wings or anything like that. 
The downside is I have to be careful when I'm arming the airplane because I'm going to be four or five inches away from a prop. So um, just be careful. Um, I'll let you know uh, how that's going to work out. So the bottom part of the cowl will always be fixed. The top half will be removed, kind of key in place with dowels and a couple of magnets. And the kind of neat thing on a, on a Newport 17, there's actually a stiffener, a cowl stiffener on the full scale right around that center line. So that'll actually help as far as the alignment pins, um, maybe even little handles to pop, to pop that thing off. But I'm just thinking that's what's noodling around in my head. And that's that's the thing I love about this hobby is all the options we have on, on, on how to do these things. So next step. All right, Joe, looks like we're going to start mounting the... Um, uh, the upper deck and cabane struts. So that would be starting at step one, uh, looking at the manual here at photo 18. And it wants our uh, quarter by five eighths by eight and a half is what it says in the manual. But when you measure these out, they're actually nine inches in length. All right, so just a little bit builder's note there. Um, we'll make that correction uh, in the manual as we go. So what it wants us to do Laid a few sides on the side, and this is we have already got the blind nuts installed. Remember, when we did that back early in, before we glued, glued them on the side. So, our blind nuts are already installed. So, that's the hard part in the top of the fuselage in those knots out. That's where the conveying struts are going to go. So, we're just going to slide one in, and in the instructions, it says it goes take it all the way down to where it bottoms out. At this point, we're not going to worry about any extra length or shaping these um, or anything like that. All we're doing at this point is just fitting them in and then marking them. And I'm gonna just do this. We can do a couple different ways. But I'm, this is my method. I'm just kind of holding it in there with my hands. I'm just tightening it in there. And then what I'm doing is I'm taking the 440 uh, cap head screws that come with the kit and I'm threading them to the exterior of the blind nuts on the, on the outside. And I'll show you, I'll tell you why here in a second. Take my ball driver here. I've got a nice tight fit. I'm bottomed out. I'm bottomed out uh, against a triangle stock, like the instructions say. And I'm just going to start screwing in these ball joints or these ball drivers, okay? And what I should be doing when I pull these out, if I've done this right, I put indentations in there. Let's take a look. All right, I can pull those out like that. And haha, there we go. Look at that. If you can see that on the screen. All right, so, and what I'm gonna do right now, I've got that. Take my marker, wherever my handy dandy marker pen or writing utensil is at. I thought I had it right here on the table, but maybe not. There we go. I'm gonna mark this one. So this one is the right side. So, there we go. I know that's the right side, all right. Again, my handy dandy drill gun. Let's drill away. Keeping everything, this does have a level on it, so it does help me on my, uh, I keep it a nice, true, and square. Okay, I didn't drill that all the way through, but there we go. That one was almost done. All right, let's see how we did. Take off the screws, because now we're going to mount it from the inside, which is where they'll be permanently, air quotes, mounted for now. I know when I mark it, I mark it on the inside, the right on the inside, so that's how I'm going to put it back in. Then later on, we'll be able to pull these off, finish them, do all that fun stuff. So put that in there like that. Get my pole driver on there. So I'm going to leave you on the screen for a second, and I'm going to go drill mine. Oh, perfect. Okay, 
Ron, are you start drilling yours yet? Yeah, mine are actually all drilled. I'm actually um, adding my screws now. Okay. <laughs> I grabbed the short, two short screws from the kit. Though they're used for something else. So I have to go, which I have right here. And my little, there they are. Yep, I did. I grabbed the short ones. Story of my life. Put that one there, grab a longer one. There it is. There she be. Let's go ahead and put that in there. Get this out of the way because I'm just making a mess now. The other long ones. Or the second cabane strut. And this little washer. There it is. All right. This is when magnetized tools kind of come into come in, come in handy, but that's all right. We're we're cooking with fire now. Is that a bad thing to say on airplanes? Yeah, I see what you mean. These airplanes a lot smaller than what I'm used to working with. <laughs> yeah, but that's all right. And just now, once you do something like this, just think how much nicer it is when you're when you're working on the bigger stuff. So, yep. but uh, yeah, it's okay. I just remember growing up as a kid, building Gillis kits and. Uh, how tedious those were and working on something like this is just actually pure joy just pure joy get that started in there i know what i'm gonna do it will make my life a little bit easier and i'm gonna share this trick with you guys because it's such a tight fit I'm gonna go ahead and round off this side a little bit. What I'm doing here is I'm rounding off this side and it's just allowing for a nice easier fit down at the bottom. So I have a little bit of wiggle room to get that uh, 440 started. There we go. All right, I'm back. Well, better. Did you get it all drilled out? Did you get both sides? Oh yeah, yep. Thanks. I'm, I'm doing, I'm fiddling a bit around here a little bit, but that's all right. Oh, I know why. I got a glue blob in there. Remember when I was talking about the glue blobs? I got one in there. Let me see if I can get that out of there. That's my problem. Okay, I got her loose. There she goes. You hear that click in? That means that she was in place. All right, let's get the other one in. And then repeat on the other side. Hey, we're looking like an airplane now, guys. This is actually looking pretty cool. So I put out a video today, if you missed it on the Facebook page, if you don't understand, because I had somebody ask a couple of questions about what I, what we were talking about, we talked about blowout. So I did a little quick video today on how to keep blowout from happening when you drill your holes. Um, if you missed that, it's on the Facebook page. 
So I'll go ahead and hit refresh on that when you were talking. Just give us the, ele the elevator pitch on it. What's that? Give us the elevator pitch on the, on the blowout uh, when we're talking about drilling. Oh, okay. So uh, basically what you do is as long as you use a backing board when you're drilling a hole, you will avoid blowout. You know, there's all kinds of fancy ways of doing it. You can use Forstner bits. You can use all this other stuff. But if you don't have any of that stuff available and you want to avoid getting the blowout altogether, if you just use a backing board when you drill your holes, mm -hmm. you shouldn't really get any blowout. That's basically the okay. gist of it. I've got one side in. I'm just going to mark this one real quick. And we'll have their side in. And then we're going to move on to, just so Ronnie, you guys catch up, we're going to start looking at uh, mounting F, uh, what is it, uh, F1Bs, which is the, stop, the top of the cabin, cabin struts, command struts, along with the aft cabane, cabane strut mount. And, guys, I'll be forefront and honest with you. I did actually screwed up on mine as I was doing some pre-building. And I screwed something up. But I'm going to show you how I'm going to fix it, which is always nice on the on the tips. So there's that one. Let me drill. Mark this one and we'll be in like really good shape. Joe and I think we're gonna be one of the very few video podcasts or whatever you want to call us that we're not talking about Tiger King. <laughs> Uh, well, I, was, I don't even know what the heck you're talking about. Yeah, we won't be okay. talking. Good, good, good. We were. Kind of a, huh? I said we were until you uh, brought it up there. Yeah, I know. I know. I just had to put that out there. But all right. I don't even know what that is. What is that? Is that a show? It's, yeah, it's a Netflix series. Uh, Dave, we don't want to use perfect mount. We don't want to use Loctite at this step because nope. we're going to be taking these back out again to finish them. Now, if you knew for sure you were never going to have to take them out again, you could use Loctite on them. But we know for sure at this point we're going to be uh, taking them back out again to yeah. dress them up. To dress them up, um, cover the airplane, uh, work on the side cheek cowls, all those kind of things. So, But we're <laughs> – Leave it to Sal. Uh-oh. Sal's talking about blowout from Taco Bell. That's a completely different kind of blowout, Sal. <laughs> you got Ronnie. Don't you got funny. Ronnie to chuckle. <laughs> Sal, you win an award. All right, that one's in. Get my hand out of there. Let's grab the next one. it this way. I love it when the airplane stands on its nose so you can actually work on it. All right. That one's in. Very good. Okay, so at this point, both the cabane struts are in. And that's your forward mounting of the top wing. All right. So what's actually we're getting a little bit further along in the book than, than we thought. So let's uh, let's keep moving forward. So it looks like we're going to jump into step four with the struts installed. We're going to glue in the three F one Bs. All right, the F one Bs. Which again, what I talked about in uh, the opening video about labeling all your parts. Uh, this is what I did. I knew there's three of them by looking at the die cut sheets. I have mine labeled. Also, again, guys, I have center lines drawn on these. And looking from the fuse on the top, if you can see that there in the video, that I have a um, center line that will just make life a lot easier. The key locations, and by knowing that my fuselage is square, use my handy dandy square, and I can lay it up against there when I when I did it when I laid those in, and all those items fell right in line. All right, so let's glue in three of the F4 or the F1Bs. 
So in this for this, I'll be using my thick CA because we are doing a balsa, balsa to a light ply for popular uh, surface. And Chuck's going to pull out in front of me because I can't run all the cameras and stuff and keep up. So That's all right. So center lines on place. Check for trueness. I'm going to cheat using my sanding block. Enough for a square. While that dries. That's good. All right. The next one, and this is where you have to be a little bit careful at, okay, on the, on the aft edge. Because tech, what this is going to do, this F1B is going to bump right against those cabane struts, guys. All right? Now, here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to do two things. Glue the F1B to the cabane struts or glue to the, F, the, the cabane struts in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tack glue this one just in a couple of spots where I know I'm away from the cabane struts, and I'll re-glue this one a little bit later when I pull the cabane struts out. So there's my center line. I don't know if you can see that in the video, guys. Center line's in place. Where's my handy dandy square? Check it for trueness. Looking good. She's in. Once again, she's tack glued in. And the last one, all right? This one I can glue in. I'm going to do something. Can see a little bit burly edge there? So I'm just going to do a nice, fresh swipe of the sandpaper. Give me a little bit true edge. And she's in. Check for trueness. She's there. Yep. I pulled my fingers off a little bit too soon. She's there. Okay, now that's your forward turtle deck formers or bulkheads. Now this is where I screwed up. Jumping into step five. Well, in step five it says we can move the strut. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. Get the screws out of there. The fun part. There's one. Get the other one out of there. Just get my fingers in there to get the screw out of there. goes okay I'll take out this one that's my right one I'm gonna set that off to the side for now put in my little basket over there that one that one Screws out, one screws out. There's the second one, Get those off the side, pull that one out. And I'm gonna mark that one so I know which one's the inside. Uh, a couple of questions on the form. Um, Sal, to answer your question, uh, yeah, balsa is still a little bit short right now, um, but I will have to tell you that it is looking a little bit brighter. We have some information, um, so things are getting better. I'm honestly, I think a little bit of that might be a little bit of the silver lining for the COVID uh, situation that we're all dealing with now. Um, I think that's slowing things down, and it's also getting some pieces in place for some other forms of manufacturing um, that are going to help us to be able to uh, replenish that stock. There's nothing definite yet, but it actually is looking better than it was, say, a month ago. 
Joe, when you and I were this past January, where we were up at the the factory, that was not looking good. The the Grim News uh, Ball so USA obviously is, is very well stocked, but you know, looking six months, um, eight months down the road, there was some definite concerns on uh, on Balsa. So, uh, but that's good news, Joe. I'm glad I'm glad to hear that. So, yeah, so it is actually getting a little bit better at this point. So, fantastic. That's good news. So, it's going to keep our hobby uh, rolling right along. Okay, guys. Full disclosure: when I was pre working this thing out, um, the next step, which is to uh, take the quarter inch by five eighths by four and a half inch bass stock with the one eighth inch screw in the middle, uh, the groove in the middle of it. And lay, and what that is, that's the rear cabane mount strut, which on a Newport 17 uh, is an inverted V. Okay, so in, what's provided in the kit is a couple of people, pieces of, of wire that are pre-bent that we do a little solder at the top and it slides into the sides. Well, in my haste, um, what you're supposed to do is, and I'll see if I can show that on there, is lay that against that bulkhead. And then what you do, or my any dandy pencil or that, again, I keep losing it here. What you're supposed to do, and I'll just run on the, if you do, is draw an outline, right? I'll just see if I can take the outline up there. All right, yeah. And what that out, what you're supposed to do with that outline is you're supposed to sand the curvature in it to match that bulkhead. All right. Well, and that's exactly what I did, except for the moron on me is I put the groove up <laughs> instead of the groove down. Stop for laughing at me, Ronnie. I heard that. Um, so here's how I'm going to fix it. And this is this is modeling. This is all part of it. So I'm going to cut the ends off where I started that sand, the other side I already did. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna glue it in place just like I normally would. And you notice that's gonna be a little bit short, all right? That's okay. Then I'm gonna take my scrap balsa and it'll come from a, uh, that's about the size of maybe one of the spars or some kind of post that we have in the kit. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cap that end with balsa on both sides I'll do one side first, glue it on, sand it nice and smooth, and then I'll have a, uh, I'll use my 440 ball driver, and I'll run it through and poke the hole out on the other side. So you guys can see that. Sorry, I'm a little bit off camera there. And I'll poke the hole out, finish sanding it, glue the other side, run it through, poke the hole, and I'm good. It's kind of what we kind of do sometimes as modelers when we bail ourselves out when we make mistakes like that, but it does happen. But so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to glue that in place with my thick CA. Is that your handy dandy thick CA? That's my handy dandy. Boss USA Gold. They're teasing. You can't see the chat, but they're teasing you because you say handy dandy. Handy dandy. <laughs> and I've All actually right. stopped trying to keep up because I was breaking stuff. So <laughs> That's all right. We'll have a better plan next time. Okay. What are you laughing at, Ryan? I do um, want to show this because well, I, I did. I did I break this. The one getting ahead now. <laughs> yeah. What's so that? I do want to show this because I did screw something up here while I was fiddling around. Because of course, as you guys all well know, me and Joe's got big man hands. So as I was messing around with my man hands trying to get my cabane struts all set up, I broke this piece of balsa right here. So what I did was I simply went in. If you make a mistake, like we've talked about, I'm calling it out. I just went in and I re-glued. Try to get this on camera. Re-glued, re-glued there, and re-glued here. And it's just as good as it was. And it's actually because of this spot right here that I glued will be stronger than it was before. Yes. Good. Yeah. And I could have just grabbed the piece. I've got more of this here. I could have just grabbed another piece and put a new piece in. But I wanted to show you that. Because a lot of times when you get these kits, you don't have a lot of extra with you. You can fix it on the fly, and that's actually perfectly fine. Once the oh, whole yeah. thing is together, that's going to be – you'll never even know that you did that. So, All right, moving right along. Once actually, I we're, we're, at, we're getting to be about where we're probably going to need to stop. We're at 54 oh, nice. minutes. Perfect. Then what I'm going to do, and I'll do this off camera, so we'll be up next time. All I'm going to do is cut my uh, three sticks. 
which is my 3 16 inch square, cut them to length, glue them into place. I'll cap my mistakes with balsa on the end, and we'll see you next time. That's where we'll start. What's where we'll pick it up next time, which next time we'll work on the aft turtle deck, which will be very similar process, minus the strut stuff, and the overlay or the, the, the light ply top uh, top turtle deck. And at that point, man, we're looking like a Newport 17 fuselage. All righty. So we've reached all the way up through to step five tonight. We will continue on from step six of the cabane and upper deck, and we'll continue on from there. Uh, don't forget, swing over to balsausa.com if you want to build along with us. Make sure that you go on and enter in coupon code N17BUILD, all caps, no spaces, to receive 10% off of your very own Newport 17 one six scale kit that cell is going on clear through the build so as long as we're still doing the build you guys will be able to take advantage of that coupon code um what else don't forget to get over to the youtube channel we are at 2870 subscribers i need to hit 3000 subscribers and we are going to give away a quarter scale kit of the winner's choice make sure you follow us on all of our thumbs up facebook page social media uh boss usa official on instagram boss at boss usa on twitter at boss usa airplanes on both facebook and youtube i want to thank everybody for showing up i want to thank the guys and shop and stay tuned for saturday from noon to one eastern standard time for the next episode also if you are so inclined and you have some time like a lot of us do tomorrow at 5 p.m eastern standard time i will be doing a live on-air interview with lane star from lane's planes those of you that are familiar with his cuda uh, he does some really cool uh, tool caddies. He does a lot of really cool stuff. And we're going to have Lane on uh, the show tomorrow. Lane's my little potato chip, so we're going to have a good time. Me and Lane go way back. So make sure you stay oh, tuned nice. for that. Uh, keep an eye on the Facebook page for more information. If you have any questions, make sure you feel free to let us know. Look at I got to show the overachiever, overachiever Ronnie is ahead of both of us at this point. Oh, yeah. It's there you go. Ugly, so that's what we're going to get to next week. Uh, Ronnie's a little being a little bit of an overachiever. I need uh, to pull away his Mountain Dew. <laughs> I, need to, I need to pull that back. I just want to <laughs> check real quick to see if we have any questions that we didn't get answered. I don't see anything off the top of my head. If I did miss something, please make sure you let us know. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching and happy building. Thanks, guys. Stay safe.